I want to preach on prayer today. This is the last weekend of our series, Undivided. And this series has been about taking topics from the scripture and having clarity on what the Bible says. And I want to preach a message entitled, Don't Give Up Praying. And I want to talk about, at times, the tension in prayer. And if we're honest, in this room and online, some of us have a hard time praying. Maybe some of us don't like praying. There's a lot of reasons for that. Maybe you know, some of us find it hard. Maybe others of us, we've tried it, and we feel like that nothing happened. There was no answer. There, you know, nothing changed. Maybe uh, we have been praying, and we still don't have the answer. And so there's multiple layers. There can be disappointment. There can be misunderstanding. There can be just so many things. And uh, by no means is this mess is going to cover every angle of prayer. But I want to focus on one side of it and encourage your faith with this thought of don't give up praying. Amen? So in Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 10, here's what Jesus said. And so I tell you, keep on asking. Now notice the language that Jesus says. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. Now notice verse 10. There's even stronger language. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Father, I thank you for this great moment, and we say more Holy Spirit today. Keep us safe in this place as we go about our week, and I pray that every one of us would lay down resistance, set aside distractions, lean in for a few moments, and receive something from you. May your kingdom come and your will be done. We love you. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. What I want to do is I want to take just a few moments before I get to verses 9 and 10. If you read the beginning of Luke chapter 11, the first several verses, about 10 or 11 verses, are on the subject of prayer. Because in verse 1, the Bible says that the disciples of Jesus, meaning Peter, James, and John, you know, Thomas, all of them, came to Jesus and they asked him, teach us to pray just as John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. So the rest of these verses are Jesus answering their question. He's teaching them how to pray. And so we go from verse 1, then we go into verse 4. In Jesus, or verses 2 uh, through 4, excuse me. And Jesus immediately begins to answer them by giving them what we call the Lord's Prayer. Maybe you've prayed this in different settings. Some sport teams do this. Some, you know, different, you know, you know, genres and places have done this. Maybe you have done it, you know, consistently. Um, and the Lord's Prayer, you know, really, if, if you don't know what to pray, the Lord's Prayer is a great place to start. And it also is really a pattern of prayer. So I just want to recap uh, uh, verses 1 through 8 here before I get to the meat of the message. And so I want to do something different today. I want us to pray the Lord's Prayer all together out loud, both in this room and online, just to practice this. Can we do that real quick together? All right. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. All right. So look, put it on the screen. Ready? Begin. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Everyone said amen to that. So that's what Jesus begins to say, and also in this is a pattern of prayer. And then he goes from this to verses 5 through 8, so after the Lord's Prayer, as some call it, he then goes into verse five. And then he is teaching about prayer through using a story. And this is very intriguing. He says this. He says, suppose you're asleep in your house at midnight and a friend comes to your house, knocks on the door, and visits you, and you're surprised. And because you're surprised, in Jewish culture, he's, he's talking in that context, when anyone hosted a guest, there were certain things that you did for that guest, particularly feeding them. So he's saying, you know, um, it's midnight and you're in bed and you have a surprise guest and you don't have any food to serve them. 
So this house owner or the homeowner who doesn't have food, he leaves his home. He goes to a friend's house and he knocks on the door at midnight, waking up his friend and his family, asking him to give him food to go back to his house and feed his surprised guest. Now, if this happened today, the cops would be called. Someone would be cussed out. You would. You remember, I remember when I was young. I'm only 20 years old. When I was young, I remember people used to show up at each other's homes. Remember this? Back in the day, you used to show up and come and visit. No, no cell phone, no, no you know, pre-warning. Just show up, and everyone was happy. People come on our porch today. We almost want to cuss them. What are you doing here? What do you want? So can you imagine this would happen today? This would be, you know, a fight. And so he's knocking, and Jesus says this in verse 8. If you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And he's talking about prayer. He's answering the question that the disciples asked, Lord, teach us how to pray. This shows us that persistence Jesus is showing us that persistence is a part of praying. He's saying that persistence is a part of continually asking Jesus and not giving up. And we keep coming and we keep going and we don't quit. Now, persistence is not twisting God's will to get him to do what you want him to do against what he knows is best for you. Does that make sense? So persistence doesn't mean we're trying to change God or get what we want and have this fantasy and just, you know, keep on going and God's going to do it. That's not what we're talking about here. We want to yield to God and let God's will be done because God knows better than us. Can someone say amen? amen. And so but what he is saying here, though, is that you and I, in our prayers, have to remember that there's, I would say, resistance to our prayers being answered. But we must resist the resistance with persistence. We must be persistent in our prayers to beat back the resistance. Did you know that the Bible says our enemy, the devil, is resisting our prayers and seeks to cause the answers not to come to us? Say, well, where's that in the Bible? Well, there's a lot of references. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, Daniel was praying for 21 days, and the Bible says that God gave him a message and said, the first day you prayed, we heard your words, but the answer was stopped in the spiritual realm, and the angel said to Daniel, now I have broken through, and I have come to give you the answer to your prayers. In Ephesians chapter 6, the apostle Paul said, we're not fighting against each other, we have to remember that. We're not fighting against each other. Not really. Ultimately, he said, we're fighting against principalities and powers, against rulers in the dark places, evil spirits that are seeking to kill, steal, and destroy. There is a devil. He's real. But I got good news. God is greater than the devil, and the devil has no power over Jesus. But we have to remember that there is spiritual. Now, this stuff in the Western culture and, and Western countries, we kind of laugh at this stuff when we talk about spiritual warfare, because sometimes Christians are weird, and when they talk about spiritual warfare, it doesn't make any sense. And, and quite frankly, we're so, and we thank God for education and our, and our cultural stability that we have in the West. Trust me, I've been around the world. We're blessed. The downside to that is we're so educated that we think if we don't see it, then it must not be real or we discount it. But Paul said that what we don't see is more real than what we do see. That means there's a spiritual realm. I got good news. There's a heaven somewhere. And, and, it's, and it's a city whose builder and maker is God. And anyone in Christ Jesus, you and I have the promise of eternity in heaven. That when you and I die, if he doesn't come back before, that our spirit will leave our body and we will go to heaven and be with God forever. Recently, I heard a Hollywood elite, recently a Hollywood elite 
He was in the media, and he said, if you believe there's a heaven, and if you believe in the Bible, you're a fool. Well, I got news for him and everyone else that heaven is real. I'm not foolish. I have faith that God is real and that the Bible is right, and heaven is a city that is there right now, and all of our friends and loved ones in Christ, they're in heaven, and there's no tears. There's no pain, and they're walking with God. They're worshiping God with the angels. They're there with family and friends right now. They're more alive than ever before. And guess what? They're not babies in diapers sitting on a cloud eating chocolate bonbons, but they're worshiping heaven or, or they're worshiping the God of heaven and they're close to God. They're in the very presence of God and they're waiting for you and I to get there. Come on, give God praise for the truth of heaven. The Bible's clear. You and I can have a Christ-filled eternity or a Christ-less eternity. Either way, it is real, and the invisible realm is real, and there is a devil who seeks to cause chaos to our prayers. He's seeking to fight us and resist us. He's seeking to cause frustration. He's seeking, to, uh, I would say, to cause hindrance in our prayers being answered. Just think about the Lord's Prayer we just prayed. Jesus said, he said it this way, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you think the devil's gonna let heaven come down to earth without a fight? Because the devil wants to cause strife, division, discord, hate, racism, death, sickness, disease. God wants unity, peace, love, forgiveness, healing, grace, mercy, growth, favor, increase, and power. That's what God wants, but there's a resistance to that. And so this is just one aspect. And so what happens is, is sometimes, this is one aspect to prayer, what happens sometimes is we forget that there is a spiritual realm that is coming against, Satan is coming against God's people. And when they pray, prayers go up and answers are coming down and the devil, he wants to stop those answers. Some say, well, if God's all powerful, why doesn't he just move and why is that the issue? Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, that Satan is the God of this world. When Adam and Eve sinned, he gained authority over the earth. That's why he has power over this realm to cause chaos. Look around us right now. It's getting crazier by the day. All of the evil is not from God, it's from the devil. But the Bible says his time is short and Jesus is coming back for his church and he will take us away with him. And then the second coming of Christ is coming where he will part the eastern sky and he will come with 10,000s of his saints and he will rule and reign. This is not some fantasy Disney movie. This is the word of a living God. Our God is real. Jesus is alive and he's coming back for his people. Hallelujah. In our delay, our delay, our misunderstandings, our confusion, our lack of knowledge at times in prayer can cause us to think these thoughts because of the delay, because of all this. We can think, well, you know, the delay to my answer means that God doesn't want it for me. We can think, well, it didn't happen the way I thought or the way I wanted, so I'm not going to pray anymore. I'm going to do it my way. We can think this, well, that person didn't get healed, so God must not heal anymore. That marriage didn't make it, so I guess God doesn't really bless marriages anymore. Think about this pattern of thought. God, you know, I mean, this person you know, passed away prematurely, so I guess it's up to chance. And we can come to these conclusions based on disappointment, and I've lost so many people in my life, all of them premature death. And we can come to conclusions, or we can say the struggle that I have is ongoing. It hasn't broke. It hasn't changed. So maybe God just wants me to live with this ongoing struggle, and I'm overwhelmed with it, and maybe God wants me to have it. Again, this is one angle to this subject of prayer, but I want you to hear me. These thoughts are common, but they're incomplete, folks. They're incomplete. Just because someone doesn't get healed doesn't mean that he's not the healer. Doesn't mean a marriage doesn't make it. Doesn't mean he's not blessing marriages. And it doesn't mean that because my friends passed away, doesn't mean that God is, you know, killing people. No, we're living in a world 
and we're coming up against the devil, but I have learned to take my grief and I give it to God and he heals me. I take my disappointment and my misunderstanding and, I, and at times my confusion and I don't let it stop me from God, but I give it to God because he is the giver of life. He's my healer. He takes my pain and turns it around for purpose. And so if you and I can take all the setbacks of our life and in this subject of prayer, when we don't understand or it doesn't happen and we didn't get it, that we don't go away from from God, but we keep coming after God. We keep reaching for God. We keep worshiping God and we give our lives to God because he's moving when we don't see it and he's moving when we don't feel it. The enemy, please hear me, the enemy of our soul, the devil, he wants to wear us down. He wants to frustrate us. He wants to give us disappointment and discourage us so we don't pray anymore. He wants us to be so distracted, so upset that we just choose to be inundated with social media and our phones. We go to news. We go to other things. We go to, we're just, because we're just disconnected, we're discontent. But I want to encourage, nothing wrong with phones and social media. I'm just saying that the enemy wants to take us away from right perspective and use all the frustrations and all the feelings of prayer and get us away. But God wants to strengthen us, encourage us, empower us to keep going, to keep praying, to keep believing, to keep reaching. And then we get to verse 9 and 10. What does Jesus say? Three things, my, my three main thoughts. He says, keep asking. Everyone say, keep asking, please. Yes. Keep asking. This is progressive. This is continual. It's not just one time. I never do it again. It's every day pursuing God and asking him and praying to him. And we can do that about the same things. We can pursue God and seek him every single day. I want to encourage you to think about this. Just don't have the Bible up to chance and say, well, I'm going to, whatever God wants me to read, I'm going to read the Bible today. And, and no, it won't happen every day. And if we do it in prayer and say, well, whatever God wants me to pray about, I'm going to pray about. Nothing wrong with asking God that. But, and I do that sometimes, but that's not a consistent plan. Here's what I do to help me keep asking God. I have a list of people that I pray for every day. I have certain things I pray over my family, over my marriage, over my kids, over my health, over my finances, over you, over the staff, over everything. I do this every day. I have a list, and it keeps me focused to pray and to keep asking God every day. Then what I do is on this list, when God has answered prayers, I check it off, and I say, God did it. And then even today when I was praying early in the morning, I saw about three to five things that God has answered. So it builds my faith. I'm not just saying mindless prayers. I'm praying and I'm seeing God move on my behalf. I'm seeing God do something. But notice what Jesus is saying, that we keep asking, that we keep coming, that we keep moving. And we know that God hears, just like with Daniel, God hears the first time we pray. And the prayers go up to God. And and what's happening is he's sending answers down. Sometimes we get answers quick and sometimes we don't. But we have to account, folks, that there is a spiritual realm and the devil is resisting. The devil wants to break up your home. The devil wants you to get sidetracked. The devil wants to take from you because Jesus said he's a thief. But God wants to bless you. God wants to help you. God wants to move in you. God wants to do great things in you. And so the answer coming down at times is resisted which is why keep asking, keep, and you just keep asking, you just keep going, and God is going to move, and it's doing something against the resistance every time we ask. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 10, we see an Italian man named Cornelius, and up to that time, the Holy Spirit was really for the Jewish people. And in Acts chapter 10, there's a man, Cornelius, in verse 3 and 4, and the Bible says that his consistent prayers and giving, he, he was helping the poor, that his prayers and giving went up to God as a memorial. And the message came that now God has heard you, and the answer got to him in that day, or actually it was three days later, that the apostle Peter came to his house and preached, and the Holy Spirit fell 
uh, as we know, for the first time to a Gentile person, meaning a non-Jewish person, and the Holy Spirit went into the nations of the world. But notice what the Lord said to him. Your prayers and giving were coming up to me as a memorial. It kept coming up. It kept coming up. It kept coming up. It kept reaching up. It kept going. 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 It kept it kept going. It kept going. I can keep going if you want me to. And then the answer came. So I want to encourage you to keep asking. I want to encourage you with this. Have specific things and specific people you pray for every day. And when God answers those prayers, check it off, cross it out, and let it build your faith that God is moving. That's a good time to say amen if you want. Have it in your Bible. Put that prayer list in your Bible. Put it on your bathroom mirror. Put it somewhere where you'll see it. Don't put it at the bottom of your nightstand where you're never, never going to see it again. Put it somewhere where you can see it. Target your faith. Keep asking. Keep going. God is moving. Then Jesus says, and notice what he says. He says, keep asking, and then he says, you will receive. You will receive. The devil wants to wear us down. God wants to build us up. And what the devil does, just real quick, what the devil does is he uses frustration, disappointment, and misunderstanding or confusion to get us away from prayer or wrong teaching. And then we don't understand what's happening, and then we get all disconnected, and we don't know what's going on. But, there, but what I'm saying today, there's so many angles to this, but this is really about an attitude of prayer that Jesus said about the man going to his friend's house at midnight and not giving up with shameless persistence until he received. And I believe that is, it ties into us with God. Now, some would say, well, man, how do I pray, PD? I don't even know how to pray. I understand that, and we'll help you with that. But like I mentioned, you can use the Lord's Prayer. You can go to Luke chapter 11, verse 2 to 4, and just pray that just to help you get started. You can say, Jesus, help. Really? Is that spiritual? Oh, yeah. Because have you been around someone that changes their voice and they start praying and getting really weird on you? Anybody? No? Just me? Maybe I'm with the weird people. Maybe you're not. But anyway, people can get weird with prayer. We don't have to do that. Say, God, today I'm struggling. I'm struggling to stay free from temptation. I'm struggling to believe that you're in my life. I'm struggling, or Lord, I'm doing great today. Uh, Lord, I give you praise, you know, whatever it is. But just talk to God. Just talk to him, man. Don't change your voice and say, hey, I mean, how you doing, everybody? Father God, in the name of Jesus. I think God's saying, what are you doing right now? <laughs> I'm praying, God, have your way. It's like, God's like, oh, man, my, my, my eardrum is bursting. No, he's not saying that. I'm just kidding. But you know what I mean? Just, just be real and honest. Communicate. I don't go to summer. I don't go to my kids and say, hey, David, how you doing? I love you, son. And then go to my wife and be like, summer, I love you. <laughs> You're the woman of my dreams. And then try to get, you know, very white voice on her, you know, and girl, you try to get deep. I don't do that. I'm just me. And then she chased me down, and I was like, just slow down a little bit, you know? <laughs> th 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 this is how, but, but how do we do this? How do we do this with prayer? I'm telling you, folks, I know in this room and online right now, several of you are ready to give up on prayer because it hasn't happened. Please don't do that. Please, you've heard maybe wrong teaching about prayer, and I want to encourage you to keep going and pray. See, the baby knows. He, he just said it. <laughs> keep going with God. Keep asking and believe in God. Then Jesus said in verse 9, keep seeking. So keep asking. Then he says, keep seeking. Please say, Keep seeking, keep seeking. You know what this literally means? I did a word study. Maybe look this up or maybe write it down now if you want. This literally means, in the Greek language, it means to search and hunt for it. That's what it means, to search and hunt for it. It means to press into God for his promises. So I have asked, Lord, I ask you to touch my marriage or you know, Lord, heal my heart or you know, whatever it is. You get what I'm saying. We ask God, then we go to seeking, and seeking is I'm pressing in, I'm hunting for it, I'm searching for it. There's over 7,000 promises in the Bible, and I'm looking for what God has said to me. I'm believing that the promises of God are real for my life. I, I don't come to God and say, and I'm saying this way, this is incomplete, and I've done this before. God, whatever you want to do in my life, do it. That's a good prayer. It's just incomplete. 
God, whatever you want to do in my marriage, that's a good prayer, but it's incomplete. Because the incomplete part is he told you what he wants to do in your life and in your marriage and in your you know, kids because it's in the Bible. There's over 7,000 promises that God says are for you. And so you and I can say that, which is good, but then now take a step further and get specific and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. David, AJ, Zayden, and Kendall shall serve God all the days of their life, and they shall be like all the plants all around my table. And then we say verses like this, I shall love my wife. And, 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 and we're going to live to be a good old age. And we're going to be naked, not ashamed. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 26. If all the men want to write that down right now. <laughs> Married men. This, this, search for it. Hunt for it. Let me just... Break something down real quick. We have a term in Bible study called the sovereignty, sovereignty, the sovereignty of God. What does that mean? I'm gonna give you the street version. It means that God is the biggest and the baddest. He can do whatever he wants to do when he wants to do it, and he's gonna do it no matter what. That's what that means, sovereignty of God. It means God's gonna do whatever he wants to do. So God is sovereign, but I want you to please hear this statement. The parts or the people that he uses to do what he wants to do are not sovereign. It's not sovereign. What does that mean? What am I saying? God, the Bible says in Isaiah, God will work who will let it. So God is sovereign. He's looking for someone to say, Lord, here I am, use me. Lord, here I am, I'm, I choose to serve you. This sounds mean, but if he wants to use somebody and they say no, he'll just go to the next person. Because God's going to get his will done in the earth. He's going to do what he wants to do. It's just about you and I have a choice to say, God, I'm yours. And I yield to you. And I want you to use me. And so I want to encourage you that notice he says, keep seeking and you will find it. Keep seeking and you will find it. Keep searching and hunting for it. In other words, get promises from the Bible, write them down, and pray them over your family. So you ask God, you know, for example, things about your marriage. You ask God for things about your future. You ask God for things about, you know, uh, your mind, your health, etc. And then you get promises. You keep on seeking and you get promises. And you begin to read the scriptures over you and your family. And you believe that what God has said is not fantasy. This is reality. And you can have it by faith. So, for example, there's a promise in the scripture of household salvation. In Acts 16, there was a jailer. He and his whole house was saved. Your household can all be saved. There's a promise of health and peace in your mind. There's a promise of a healthy marriage. And there's a promise of having the Spirit of God walk out a single life if you feel called to do that. There's a promise in the Lord of a financial blessing and that God will bless your money. Oh, yeah, yes, God will bless your money as you do it God's way. There's a, I mean, there's a promise for every facet of your life. And so I encourage you to go for it. Keep seeking. I had a friend of mine uh, in the last year and a half, without going into the details, his family was up against a major crisis that was not caused by his family. It was an outside situation that was trying to come into the family, and it was crazy, and it caused tension, anxiety, fear. It was, it was wild, and he was doing 100 days of prayer un a hundred straight days of unbroken prayer. And I remember him telling me about his consistency and he was praying and he was believing. I don't understand this and I don't know how it works, but I do know this. On day 89 of his 100 days of prayer, something broke. That situation was totally stopped. It was totally over. It was totally taken care of and it's never come back. I want you to know, I don't care if it's day 100, day 89, day one, day seven, day 1,000. I'm going to keep seeking. I'm going to keep searching. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep believing because God is on my side. Come on, give God praise real quick. He will move for you. You know, I think about a story. I like sports. And I recently saw an interview of the late Kobe Bryant. And they were talking to him about Michael Jordan. And Kobe came out of high school. He was 18 years old when he came into the league. And the interviewer was asking about Michael Jordan. And he said, Michael helped shape his game. And then when he got into the league, he was giddy. He was excited about going up against Michael Jordan. So he goes to his teammates and he says, 
Tell me what it's like playing against Michael Jordan. Now, this is NBA language. I'm not gonna cuss, just chill out. This is, um, <laughs> this is kind of their vernacular. So he goes to his teammates, and he says, and he's just a rookie, hasn't played him yet. He says, tell me what it's like playing against Michael Jordan. His teammate said, we don't call him that. He's black Jesus. We call him black Jesus or we call him that cat. And we don't speak to him and we don't call him Michael Jordan. And Kobe, as an 18-year-old kid, said, I'm not calling him black Jesus. And he's not a black cat. He's Michael Jordan. And I'm coming for him. And I love this attitude of an attitude and a demeanor that he was amazed by Michael's game, but he wasn't afraid. And when he played them the first time, Mike got the ball on the baseline in Chicago. He spun on him. He dunked on Kobe. Welcome to the NBA. I'm Michael Jordan. And Kobe said before the game, I made up in my mind, you may dunk on me, you may cross me, you may shoot on me, you may do whatever, but I'm coming at you every single play. I'm getting off the floor and you're going to see me right in your chest. I'm coming. I'm not afraid of you. What if we do that in our faith? I'm coming after God. I'm going to seek God. And the devil knocks me down. I'm getting back up. I'm going to to keep asking. I'm going to keep seeking. I don't care who leaves me. I don't care who goes away from me. I don't care what I understand. I'm going to keep asking. I'm going to keep seeking. I'm going to keep coming. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep doing because God's going to move someday. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does heaven want to give to your life? What does heaven want to do for your family? What does heaven want to do for your future? What does heaven want to do for your present? Don't let go. Keep asking and keep seeking. Amen. What happened to him? Coffee and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Keep asking. Keep seeking, verse nine. Then he says, finally, keep knocking. You know what this word knock means? In the Greek, it means to prove. Prove, prove that God is real. That's what it literally means. Keep knocking until you prove it. Keep coming, keep knocking. That's what Axel Rowe says. Thank you, someone knows. He's not in the Bible. Axel Rose is from the Bible of Guns and Roses. And he says, knocking on heaven's door. Okay? In all seriousness, what if you and I say, well, why are we begging God? We're not begging God. I'm pursuing God. And again, remember, he wants to give, the Bible says, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. And again, let me preface one more time. This is an aspect, one angle of prayer. There's multiple angles to all this. But one thing that we have to remember is when prayers go up, I'm gonna say this again, when prayers go up, we know in Daniel's case, we know in Paul's case, we know in many cases in Scripture that the prayers went up and when when God was coming down with the answer, there was a delay because of the resistance of spiritual activity. I wish we in America would just understand that spiritual warfare is real. I remember one time I was preaching, and uh, I was talking about, I was using a story in the message about a a, a man who used to be a Satanist. He would fast and pray to Satan. It's crazy. And he was like a witch, and God set him free. And uh, he was on a Christian television station giving his story. And I was talking about, in this message, I was relaying some of the things he was saying they did in like a Satan church, satanic church. And I remember I was preaching about it and I said a statement, he said, and right over here, there was a guy, a father and his two sons, he just got up and just ran out of here like a little scaredy. I was like, come on, man. Why are we so weird about this stuff? It's not weird. God's real. The devil doesn't want God to come and do what he wants to do. So it takes someone pursuing and praying and not giving up. It takes someone asking, seeking, and knocking. Knocking on the door. Remember what Jesus said in verse 8? I was just quoting it to you. Didn't read it yet, but it wasn't a verse in the message. But he said, you will receive from your shameless persistence. Keep knocking. I'm going to prove God, man. People may mock me and say that this is all stupid and this isn't real, and you're just trying to cope through life. Well, you need a crutch. You're exactly right. I need two crutches. 
<laughs> I need a lot of help in life. You, you, you got that right. I need a lot of help in my mind. How about you? I just keep knocking. I'm proving God here, man. I'm coming after the Lord, and I, I want God to move, and someone's going to get wore down. Please hear me. And some of you may be a wore down. There's no shame in this. Someone's going to get wore down. Let's make the decision that the enemy is going to get wore down, and we're going to keep going and keep praying, and, and we're not going to quit. And we're not going to give up because we can resist the resistance with our persistence. Jesus said, knock, and the door will be open. I want to encourage you to believe what God says over what others say. I want to encourage you, again, resist the resistance with persistence. Decide to not give up. Just decide, I'm not giving up. No, it's not, no, if I can't. No, I decide I'm not giving up. I decide I'm going to see God move. Now, notice I didn't say I'm going to control God. No, no, no. No, no, I'm saying that. I'm deciding I'm not quitting, and I'm going to see God move and do something in my lifetime. I decide to have victory in Christ. I decide that I don't give up praying and that I pursue Jesus. You know what we do? We do things every day, and we're consistent. One thing we do every day is get on our phones. You know they say the average person checks their phone 500 to 1,000 times a day. We have a lot of energy. We have a lot of time. And we're using that for things that are important to us. We hopefully shower every day. We... I'm not being facetious. There's a lot of things we do every day. Why not add, I'm going to pray every day, and I'm going to keep asking and keep seeking and keep knocking, and I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to get a plan, read one verse, a whole chapter, doesn't matter. I'm just going to start because we do a lot of things every day. We can do this. I'm going to be strong with you right now. Please don't say I can't do it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And Jesus said, some of you, this is powerful. He said, some of you, your heart is too full for my teaching. I've been thinking about this verse in John, and I want to preach this because we have to make room in our heart for Jesus to come. This is why, one reason why we're having prayer tonight as a church at five o'clock here at, at this location for one hour, five to six. I felt at the beginning of the year, we needed prayer every day. So there's a group of ladies that pray, help us pray Monday through Friday, one hour a day. You're welcome to join them. My mother leads that out and sets that up with the schedule. Then I felt to do once a month church-wide prayer gatherings, to have a hunger for God stir up and we reach out to God and we pers and, and this message, we're persistent, we keep going and we keep believing and we keep reaching and that's why we're doing it tonight at five to six. I wanna encourage you to come. Go home, take a nap. Sunday naps are amazing, right? Take a nap, get up, come back at five, pray for an hour, then go to Jiffy Treat and get some ice cream and, play that, and just pray that God take all the calories out in Jesus' name. No, let's pray. Let's seek God. Let's do this because we're not gonna give up. We're not going to quit and we're not gonna give up praying. And in closing, because I've read too much from the Bible, I've had too much happen in my life, and I've read and learned from history. I love a lot of different characters from our country. I love the President Franklin D. Roosevelt. He was my grandfather's hero. He was the president. My grandfather was a young man. A lot of, he was in the, he was in the military, and he loved FDR. I like him when I read about him and understand what he did for our country, I like Dr. King. He's been a hero since I was in second grade. I also like Abraham Lincoln. And I appreciate what he did for our nation. But I wanna give you an insight to something because it ties into this message in multiple ways, both with persistence and prayer and with fasting. Abraham Lincoln was defeated in political elections nine times. He was defeated nine times. He was defeated nine times. He started a business and, and, he, and he lost it. 
Then he started a second business and it went bankrupt and it took him 17 years to pay off the debt of that business. Then he fell in love and he got engaged and that fiance died and he was heartbroken. Did you know that in 1836, Abraham Lincoln spent six months in bed from a nervous breakdown and he kept coming. Finally, in 1860, he was elected as the president of the United States. What many people don't know, because it's church history, that at that time, in the mid-18, during this time, I'd say about five years before this election, it really, this really picked up steam. Not that it happened, didn't happen before, but it picked up steam. In Pennsylvania and in New York State, abolitionists and Quakers in a community, what we believe is to be about 5,000 to 8,000 of them, begin to pray and have prayer meetings every week and would fast every week and pray against slavery and pray that it would stop in our country. And they would do this all the time. Did you know that Quakers and abolitionists were attacked, their homes were burned, and some of them lost their businesses from people that were pro-slavery and trying to intimidate them to back down, but they didn't. And they kept fasting and praying, fasting and praying, fasting and praying, fasting and praying. And finally, somehow this guy who gets beat nine times all of a sudden is an underdog and gets elected as president and has the courage and the fortitude to end slavery. Now, here's what's, here's what's crazy about Abraham Lincoln. And he's a hero, but this is just the facts. Did you know that he did not have proper view of African Americans? He did not see them correctly. And, 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 and furthermore, when it came to his agenda, slavery was not number one to end it. It was number three. His main concern was that our country would not be divided into two. But slavery was number three, and his view of African Americans wasn't right. However, he did believe that no human should be enslaved. So I want you to see that somebody's praying and fasting up north believing that this atrocity ends, God, I believe, you may like this or not, but I believe this, I believe God somehow got this guy into office who didn't even have the right perspective necessarily of the people that were enslaved, but he had enough courage to end slavery, and God answered people's prayers because multiple people, multiple angles came together, and God moved in our country. Then he abolishes slavery. He doesn't live 15 days later. And God moves in our country and changes the tide. We have a lot of work to do, but man, this was a big deal in our nation. But what if God would move right now again? What if God would move again when his people humble themselves and pray and seek his face and add a little fasting and not give up? Could not God move in our country? Absolutely. Could not God do a third great awakening from the north, the south, the east, and the west? Cannot God send a wave of the Holy Spirit? Cannot God save teenagers? Cannot God visit our children? Cannot God heal marriages? Cannot God heal racism? Can I... Can our God not go to the ghetto and rescue people out of depravity? Cannot God do a miracle? Absolutely he can. He's waiting for people to humble themselves and pray. And guess what? He can use whoever he wants to use. He can do whatever he wants to do. He's going to use messed up people. He's going to use people that don't have it all together. He's going to use people that have a little issue, but they got enough courage to do what God says to do. He's not needing perfect people. He just needs someone to say, God, here I am. Use me one more time. I'm telling you, God's going to move in your house. Your family shall be saved. Your prayers shall be answered. Don't quit. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. Keep going. God is moving. Come on, stand to your feet and give God praise today. Let your heart be stirred. Let your faith be stirred. Let your spirit open up and let God come through your prayers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I believe that as we pray as a church, God is going to answer our prayers individually and as a church. Please bow your heart and bow your head to heaven. Just take someone to say, I'm not going to quit. Just take someone to say, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to ask, seek, and knock. 
I'm going to believe that God is going to move and do what I can't do. You would say today, Pastor Dave, I've never received Jesus, and I want to receive Jesus. That means you've never said, Jesus, save me. Today is the day of salvation, Paul said in 2 Corinthians. Some would say, Pastor Dave, I have done that, but I've drifted from God, and I need to come back to the Lord today. If that's you in this moment, and you want to reach up and receive Jesus for the first time and or come back. We don't embarrass you. We're here to help you move forward. That's why heads are bowed and hearts are bowed in the room and online. And you would say, Pastor Dave, that's me. I need this today. I need Jesus. Right now, shoot your hand up. I want to pray for you to receive Christ today and come to him. God bless you today. Excellent. God bless you today. God bless you today. Excellent. God bless you today. Good. God bless you today. God bless you today. Good. And then you would say, Pastor Dave, I'm tempted to quit praying. I'm tempted to give up. I'm tempted. But I want the strength to keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. I want God's help to use me for his glory. If that's you, go ahead and raise your hand. I want to pray for you all over this room and believe that God's going to help you. Amen. I see hands up. Thank you so much. Keep going. Follow me in this prayer so no one's left out. Everyone out loud and say, Lord Jesus, my heart is yours, and I run to you. Please forgive me for anything that's wrong in my life. I turn from that. I say yes to you. I'm yours. Holy Spirit, give me the strength to have persistence. I keep asking. I keep seeking. I keep knocking. I believe I receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give Jesus a great hand. Give up a praise today.